Okay, welcome back everybody. We were finally gonna actually be solving some second order PDEs, some of these Holy Trinity PDEs, and really we're gonna be using everything we developed in the last video, the Fourier multipliers and the functional calculus for this Laplacian to do that. Let's just briefly recall that the only solutions to the Laplace equation in, in these domains, which the Fourier series and transform are, are naturally suited to, were trivial, they were constants uh, in, the, in the bounded case and, and zero in the unbounded case. But we do have some very non-trivial solutions when it comes to the heat and wave equations. So we're going to start with this proposition, which I'm calling Fourier series solution to the heat equation. And we're just going to take a quick look at the, the way the PDE itself is displayed here. What I have at the first row, you should be able to tell, is the definition of the heat equation with heat conductivity 1. Uh, and then the second equation here is an initial condition. You can think about that as a boundary condition too. It's a boundary, the boundary of time being equal to zero. So it's the initial condition when time is equal to zero. And basically the function f is describing the initial distribution of heat over, over space. And then we want to be careful with this third case. This is how we know that the Fourier series can apply is that we've included ourselves with the periodicity condition. And in fact, I'm including myself over the, the, the D torus when I covered the torus last video. So we have this periodicity condition, which tells us once we read that, the Fourier series applies. And once we know the Fourier series applies, we know that what is this term right here? This is the Fourier multiplier corresponding to e to the t delta. So we're basically saying that our solution phi is e to the t delta f of x, it's e to the t delta times our initial distribution of heat. So this is just how heat evolves from the beginning. But there's no actual concept of what that collection of symbols means unless we're in the space of a Fourier series. And so this is where we get to, we have to create this or create the solution with the Fourier series. And so I'm going to highlight just a few terms here. If I only highlighted the summation and then the exponential and then I and X, that is F of X. It has to be F of X. That is the, the Fourier reconstruction of F of X by, by means of the Fourier series. So the only new term to solve the heat equation is this minus T magnitude of N squared. That's what's solving the heat equation for us, or that's what's evolving heat over time for us. So if we think about maybe how, how would we actually go about this when we see it in, in reality, what do I need? I need to calculate first the Fourier series transform for f of x, my initial condition. And then secondly, I need to reconstruct or calculate the reconstruction of, well, that's the, the Fourier series of F and multiplier e to the minus t magnitude n squared. So it's a combination of having the Fourier series of F and this multiplier, which really is my solution that's going to solve the heat equation for me. So let's actually see this in, in action. And I make a little remark here that basically says I'm going to let my vector x be the scalar x in R. So I'm going to restrict myself to one spatial dimension, in which case the Laplacian should be thought about as, as partial x squared, right? In one dimension, I only have one spatial direction to take the Laplacian in. And so in this example, I'm going to solve the heat equation periodic on a circle, or really the one torus or minus pi to pi with the two ends connected to each other, however you want to think about it. And it's going to be displayed as, once again, it's the heat equation. And then I have my initial condition here. What does my initial condition look like? It's 1 when x is between minus pi and minus 7 eighths pi. And it's also 1 when x is between 7 eighths pi and pi. And then it's 0 everywhere else. Let's actually draw that. So if there's minus pi and here is pi, the height of my function, it's going to be equal to 1 over here and it's going to be equal to 1 over here. And then it's 0 everywhere between. 
And then this is periodic, right? Because if I if I connected the ends up here, then it's really just equal to one in some interval around uh, pi and negative pi, which are assumed to be the same thing. And then I've included my periodicity condition, which reassures me that I can use the Fourier series to actually compute all of this. Okay, so if I'm going to do that, let's follow those steps I had written earlier. So first I need to compute the Fourier series transform. of my initial condition. And that's a Fourier series transform of this, right? So I'm going to compute the transform of that. How do I do that? It's not that bad, right? In one dimension, this we're looking at one over two pi. I'm taking the integral from minus pi to pi. Let's give this function a name, f of x, f of x, e to the i n x dx, actually there's a minus sign there. And then we have to figure out how to actually compute this. Well, computing piecewise inter integrals, uh, you know, I know it's been a while since Calc 1, but the way you compute piecewise integrals is you just break the integral up. Break up integral where pieces change. And so this integral is going to be equal to a 1 over 2 pi integral from minus pi to minus 7 eighths pi. And then f of x is equal to 1 over that interval e to the minus i n x dx plus 1 over 2 pi integral minus 7 eighths pi to positive 7 eighths pi f of x is equal to 0 over the middle section and then finally the last section 7 eighths pi to pi don't forget my 1 over 2 pi out front f of x is equal to 1 in the last section e to the negative i n x dx. And so if I'm computing each of these individually, I can forget about the zero. That's gone. Let's compute this term. An antiderivative of e to the negative i n x is negative 1 divided by i n, and then e to the negative i n x. I still have a 1 over 2 pi coming along for the ride, and that's evolving between minus pi and 7, negative 7 eighths pi. And then my final term is going to be something similar, right? I'm going to have minus 1 over 2 pi i n e to the minus i n x evolving between 7 eighths pi and pi. So if I evaluate at the bounds, what do I have? E negative e to the negative i 7 eighths pi n plus e to the negative i n pi all over 2 pi i n minus e to the negative, oh, that should be positive there, that should be positive there because they were both negative inputs, e to the negative i n pi minus e to the negative i n 7 eighths pi all over 2 pi i n. Okay, what do we get here? This is negative 1 to the nth power. This is negative 1 to the nth power, and you'll notice there's a minus sign between them. So those are canceling. And then what am I left with? I have a negative e to the i 7 eighths pi n. I have a negative negative, so I have a positive e to the negative i and 7 eighths pi. Combine those all to together, all over 2 pi i n. And if we use Euler's formula, we find out that this is 2 times negative 1 to the n sine n pi over 8. And then there's still a, an n in the denominator coming along for the ride. So that's going to be true when n is non-zero. Um, as always with the Fourier series, when n is zero, what we do is we calculate the average value over the interval. Recall that was a length of seven, well, it's, it's a length of one eighth pi, one over eight pi, that's a length of one over eight pi. Add those together, we get one over four pi, pi over four. So let's say you compute Fourier series transforms, and then step two, right, that was step one, step two was reconstruct the Fourier series with the multiplier. Okay, so there was my Fourier series transform, and I'm going to write it out, but then I'm going to include the multiplier when I write out the Fourier series. So there's the multiplier I include. And this truly is my solution. You, you have to leave the solution like this. There's not really anything better you can do in most situations. That's why I say, unfortunately, there's no closed form expression for this function. It's totally satisfactory to leave it as, as an infinite sum. However, if we ever want to plot it, what we do is we truncate, right? We're going to take a few collect, select terms from this sum, 
and draw them, write them out explicitly, and then we can actually plot this collection. And when we plot this collection, recall that we're evolving over the torus. So recall the heat evolves over a torus, meaning think about we have the heat evolving through a wire and suppose we connected the ends of the wire together. So the heat is evolving over a loop of wire. In this specific situation, because this is minus pi and also pi, then you'll notice here's my initial 7 eighths pi and here's my initial negative 7 eighths pi. Right, that's those points. And so I'm hot within that region, I'm cold everywhere else. What does this look like as it evolves? You can just kind of see the heat evolve around the torus over and over. And if I wait long enough, it really starts to get close to equilibrium. And so that's what we get when we use the, the Fourier series to approximate the solution to a heat equation. And we can do the same thing with the Fourier transform. So the only difference when we get to this proposition regarding the Fourier transform is that instead of instead of working with the, the periodicity condition over, over a bounded interval, we have an unbounded interval or, or RD, and then we're asking ourselves about the integrability condition. So everything else looks the same, but now we just included the integrability condition and we're over the, the, the unbounded space RD instead. We still have some initial heat distribution F of X. And what do you know? The solution is basically the same. I've just replaced the summation with an integral and my variables with Y's instead of N's. And then you know we're, we're integrating over volume. So everything looks the same. This is just the inverse transform of the forward transform of our initial heat, right? So that's the transform of the initial heat. And then I have to include my Fourier multiplier. Include the Fourier multiplier for reconstruction. So really all of these solutions look the same. You perform a Fourier transform of the initial condition. You make sure to include the Fourier multiplier when you reconstruct, and that's that. That's all that we ever have to do. So we're going to do the same thing here. We'll look at an example. So here's a nice example where I still have the heat equation displayed for me. It says I'm over an unbounded interval. It says, hey, I've got an initial condition, which once again is piecewise. Now I'm piecewise over the interval minus 1 to 1 is where I start out non-zero, and then we're going to give myself the integrability condition where I make sure that I'm square integrable over all of time. All I have to do is follow my steps. So step one, in this case, it's find the Fourier transform of initial condition, which is right here. So I'm going to take the Fourier transform of that. Let's recall what it is by definition. That's one over the square root of two pi integral from minus infinity to infinity. Of, give this a name, f of x, of f of x, e to the minus i x y dx. Well, once again, it's piecewise, so I'm going to split it up between negative 1 and 1 and everything else. So if I split it between negative 1 and 1, that's where I'm non-zero. It's equal to 1 there, e to the negative i x y dx, plus, well, it's 0 everywhere else. So I'm going to leave it at 0 everywhere else. I just find the antiderivative here, 1 over root 2 pi, negative i y times e to the negative i x y negative one to one now this is particularly x is the variable that's getting plugged in for negative one and one so when i plug a one in for x i have e to the negative i y and then subtract plugging negative one in for x e to the i y all over negative root two pi i y a little bit of simplification this ends up as pi over, sorry, 2 over pi, root 2 over pi. This should look like, especially with an i there, that should look like Euler's formula for sine. And then there's a y coming along for the ride. So that's Euler's formula for sine of y, and then there's still a y in the denominator. So that's how we find the Fourier transform of that initial condition. And then we're going to reconstruct. So step two is always reconstruct with the inverse transform and include the Fourier multiplier. Well, here's my Fourier multiplier, e to the minus ty squared. And then the inverse transform is everything else, right? Everything else there, that's exactly an inverse transform. And I've included the Fourier multiplier. Now my job is a little trickier. I actually have to figure out what this inverse transforms to. And you'll notice what I have here is ERF and ERF. It's a very special function. That's the integral of the Gaussian starting at zero for the antiderivative of the Gaussian starting at zero. So in fact, I wouldn't expect you, I wouldn't expect this by hand. 
but a computer algebra system. Should give it. Okay, you should be able to get this answer using a computer algebra system, computing that integral. And when you do that, this one is like, you know, it's got a pseudo closed form, right? As long as you define the error function correctly, you've got a closed form. And what this looks like as the heat evolves, right? This is describing the, the amount of heat, maybe on some infinitely long bar. It starts out in the range that you want it to. And then over time, you can see the heat just kind of spreads. It diffuses away from its initial conditions and eventually it gets very, very nice and broad. So you get a very broad heat distribution. Eventually that would tend to zero, right? Because everything kind of just, all of the heat just kind of decays out towards infinity. And so that's a heat equation um, on an unbounded domain using the Fourier transform. We do the exact same thing with the wave equation. We just have to be careful when we get to the wave equation. You know, everything's really behaving the same. But in the wave equation, because I have two derivatives in time, I can't get away with just an initial condition in space. Like this is the initial shape of the wave. So you start with an initial shape of a wave, but you also have to include an initial wave velocity. So it's got an initial shape, it's got an initial velocity. So just make sure that you're looking for both of those terms when you deal with a wave equation, that you have an initial shape and an initial velocity. Makes perfect sense, waves have both a shape and a velocity. Um, but make sure that you find both of those and then both of them actually will play a role in the solution, right? The, the, the propagation of a wave should depend on its initial shape and velocity. So we're gonna make sure to include both of those in the solution as well. In this case, this is the situation where I'm working with the Fourier series and I can tell once again, because it's telling me that I have a periodicity condition and equivalently that I'm working over the D torus. So I know that the Fourier series applies. And once I know that the Fourier series applies, I can go right to my solution. So my solution is gonna be just slightly more complicated. Now in step one, I calculate the transform, the Fourier series transform. of both f and g, so f my initial shape and g my initial speed. And then in step two, my reconstruction comes along with the multiplier. But you'll recall there's actually two Fourier multipliers for the wave equation. If you jump back to the last video, I said that the Fourier multiplier was e to the plus or minus i t absolute value of n. Because of this plus or minus, there's actually two of them here. That's a good thing. Why is that a good thing? Because we really have two initial conditions that we have to meet. And so you can't meet two initial conditions unless you have two degrees of freedom. This is how they show up. You get a linear combination of the initial conditions on each of our solutions. So what's going on here is I have an initial com linear combination of initial conditions to give the correct, well, number one, shape, and number two, velocity, right? We really need two degrees of freedom to reconstruct an initial shape and initial velocity, and that's how they end up combining. Okay, so you just gotta keep in mind, we've got this one over N going on right next to G, uh, that's going to be a little bit important because you can imagine when n equals zero, you're actually dividing by zero here. So you have to keep that in mind as something you you may need to consider when you're when you're finding the inverse of these. Um, but it is just included as it sits there. And the way that you, you solve this is that, of course, when n equals zero, that's equal to e to the zero, and that's equal to e to the zero. So we're really just doing a minus i and a plus i, and these cancel. So these second terms are assumed to cancel when absolute value of n equals zero. Um, and then when you take a derivative you, in time, you pull down one of these, and then you allow these to cancel with that uh, when you take a derivative in time. So just use it as it is and just make sure that if you were to reconstruct it, you allow those terms to cancel, even though technically you're dividing by zero with the way that's stated. Um, I could have stated this as a piecewise uh, function that depends on n being zero or non-zero. That's way too much work, and I think everybody understands what's happening when n is zero or non-zero. Uh, the proof basically is is just going through actually finding that linear combination to make these work with the the initial conditions. So I'm not going to go through that proof. If you want to look through it, you can see how how the linear combination shows up. 
bring it into an example of how this is actually performed. And the process is basically the exact same. So step one, I'm going to look at my initial conditions and I'm going to compute the Fourier transform or Fourier series transform of initial conditions. And let's be clever here. I think a lot of people try to compute Fourier series transforms of cosines and sines by using integrals. Do not use integrals to compute the Fourier series transform of cosines and sines. They are already Fourier series. If I write out cosine of 2x using Euler's formula, this is e to the 2i 2x plus e to the minus i 2x divided by 2, also known as 0 plus 1 half e to the i 2x plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 1 half e to the minus i 2x plus 0 dot 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 dot. That is a Fourier series. Writing cosine in Euler's formula is a Fourier series. There's nothing more complicated to it than that. If I want the transform, I'm just looking at the coefficients associated to that particular integer power of e. So we're looking at Fourier series transform of cosine. My coefficients are 1 half in exactly two cases when the powers are equal to plus or minus 2. That's it. That is the Fourier series. I can do the same thing with sine. If I write out sine of x, e to the ix minus e to the minus ix, all divided by 2i. Well, what is that equal to? That's equal to dot, 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 0 plus e1 over 2i e to the ix plus minus 1 over 2i e to the minus ix plus 0 plus dot, dot, dot. So there's exactly two non-zero terms. They take the form plus and minus 1 over 2i, and the powers of the exponential are equal to plus or minus 1. That's it. Every other term is 0. So these are already Fourier transforms. If, as long as you identify the coefficients and the powers, you know what the Fourier series transform looks like for both cosine and sine. So don't try to perform integrals. Your, your life is going to get way harder than it needs to be for cosine and sine. We found those in step one. Step two is to reconstruct. I'm going to say reconstruct according to the formula now because it's a little too much work to say you know, with the Fourier multiplier, et cetera, et cetera, the solution formula. So what's the solution formula look like? Well, it looks like this. This is the first term in the solution formula. Remember, there's always two, always two different linear combinations corresponding to different Fourier multipliers. So we always have two linear combinations and two different Fourier multipliers, but there they are, the first and the second. And then, in fact, since there are only finitely many terms, which are non-zero here, so I should comment, only finitely many non-zero terms, we can actually write out all of the non-zero terms. Here they are. So these are all of the non-zero terms in that collection up above. And when we write those all out, we can actually reverse engineer Euler's formula. We find the following. We have 1 half cosine 2 t minus x, 1 half cosine t minus x, minus 1 half cosine t plus x, and 1 half cosine 2 t minus x. Actually, this is a plus. We decide to plot this once again. Recall we're on the torus. So this is a wave evolving on the torus. So you think about it as a loop of wire sending a wave through the loop of wire with a little, maybe a loop of rope, um, right, a rope. And then you send a wave by shaking the rope really quick. We have activated the rope here and here right away. And then the initial wave velocity is sending these terms upward. They come together. They coalesce over here. You get some constructive interference. They pass through each other. They come back to where they started. Now they're traveling in the opposite direction. And they come through each other to the backside. They constructively interfere and pass through each other again, and so on. And so you get these waves traveling around the rope. And, and we can represent this with a heat map on the torus. Lots of ways of thinking about this. We can do the same thing with the Fourier transform, right? So it's just like before. Um, nothing's really special except that we're on an unbounded domain. We still have an initial condition, initial velocity, and the integrability condition. And our solution now, we're replacing a sum with an integral. But we have the exact same linear combination of the transform in, of both initial conditions. So everything basically looks the same. Just replace the sum with the integral. Let's look at one of those examples. Here, what I've got is an initial condition, which is a Gaussian. So initial shape of my waves a Gaussian. What have I done with the initial velocity? I said, well, this is actually the derivative of the Gaussian in the x direction. So I'm doing one derivative in the x direction of the Gaussian. Um, I'm going to say that's my derivative in time. 
Well, we can compute the Fourier transform in both of these fairly easily. Let's recall. So for step one, compute Fourier transform of both initial conditions. The Fourier transform of the Gaussian, you could go all the way back to your, your Fourier transform table, or you could recall the Fourier transform of the Gaussian is a Gaussian. Similarly, if you go back to the Fourier transform table, you will find that the Fourier transform of a derivative is the same as multiplying by negative i y in the transform space. And so we know that since the second one is just the derivative of the Gaussian, we just multiply by negative i y in the transform space. Step two, we reconstruct according to the formula. So according to our formula above, we just here's my first linear combination. It's right there. And then here's my second linear combination. We're going to reconstruct according to the formula. And then, OK, technically, I still have the Gaussian sitting around. But then we are going to compute the inverse Fourier transform according to the formula and just make sure that we can do it all. Now, I would also advise that you use a computer algebra system if you want to actually write this out in the variable x, although I think it's super common to just leave this as the solution. For many situations, we consider this integral the solution. We don't like simplify it any farther than that. So it's super common just leave it as the integral, even though it looks ugly, because a lot of times you can't actually compute what this would look like. In this case, we can. It's a fairly simple computation. It's really just a shifted Gaussian. over time. So really, this is just a time evolving Gaussian. And we plot out that time evolving Gaussian. And what we see is that we've got our initial wave speed that I guess is just perfectly to the right. And so our initial Gaussian wave just evolves consistently to the right over time. So I make a little bit of comment here. With this uh, particular initial velocity, the wave behaves like a, a soliton is the word that we sometimes use, or wave packet traveling to the right. So certain cases where your wave packet is kind of compactly supported and only evolves to the right, or to the left or in one direction, you call that a wave packet or a soliton. It doesn't really break up at all over time. So it would, not, it would be not uncommon for, with a different initial velocity for the wave to actually split right away. It wouldn't be uncommon for the wave to split to the left and the right and you get something like that, two little waves moving to the to either side or something more complicated. But this is a special case of a soliton. Anyway, that's all I've got today. Pretty cool, pretty cool little chapter. I think it's it's really nice that the Fourier series and transform gives us such useful solution formulas. I mean, they look ugly with the integrals and the, and the sums, but they're so elegant in just the fact that you just grab the initial conditions in both cases and just plug them right in, and you're good to go. And these are some of the most popular, common, useful equations in PDEs, so it's, it's really nice to have these at our disposal. Anyway, that's all I got. Uh, we'll move on to classification of some second-order linear PDEs in the next section. I'll see you then. Bye.